Hey folks, welcome to another episode of Sound Decisions here on Passion for Sound. This episode is going to be broken into multiple parts because it's another of the interview series I've been doing with various industry experts. This time around it's Jason Stoddard from Shit Audio who was kind enough to give me about 90 minutes of his time to talk about the Shit brand and various other amplification related topics that I think you may find interesting. In this first video, Jason talks about how they go about designing new products and deciding which ones they like. He talks about some of the thought decisions around introducing integrated designs as well as discrete designs into their range. And most interestingly to me at least, he talked to me about why amplifiers that measure exactly the same can sound so different, as well as why discrete and integrated designs can also sound so different. So I found it really interesting and enlightening. I hope you do too. Sit back and enjoy part one of the interview with Jason Stoddard. First, of, first and foremost, Jason, I just want to say thanks for giving your time today. I know the viewers really appreciate having the, the input from experts in the industry. We've had a couple now from, um, so we've had Rob Watts from Cord Electronics. We've now had um, Dan Schmolly from Bottlehead. So it's nice to get an, another perspective and another, uh, another view this time on probably solid state amps and hybrids in your cases, as opposed to the, the tube amps from Bottlehead and the DACs from Cord. So um, thank you for your time today. And I'm sure everyone really appreciates the input. Well, thanks for having me. I mean, I, I don't know how much of an expert I am, but I'll, I'll endeavor to make up, <laughs> oh, sorry, to actually uh, answer uh, anything you ask. No problem. Sounds good. That's great. Thank you. So let's let's kick off with, I've recently reviewed the Shit Heresy amplifier. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously, uh, my understanding of the name is because you've gone against your traditional philosophy of discrete designs only. So one of the questions I, I wanted to start us off with was what triggered this shift? You've obviously still got the Magni 3 Plus, which is your discrete version. Why do both? Great question. Um, actually, a couple of reasons. One is we actually have been using um, IC output stages for quite a while, We've, or integrated circuit you know, output stages, op amps for a while. But usually in products like Fulla, you know, a $99 DAC amp or um, in the case of Hell, which is a $189 um, a gaming, I guess you call it gaming slash office uh, amp because it has microphone input and it's got amps and DAC, you know, DAC capability. So we've been doing that for a while. Uh, the reason we brought it to Magni was really simple. Um, there's a lot of chatter out there about, you know, measurements and, you know, you know how it matters, you know, why it matters, et cetera. And there was some chatter about like, well, uh, Magni 3 doesn't measure all that great, you know, um, you know, it, it measures, you know, what, you know, pretty much what you'd expect a, a low gain discrete amp to measure. Um, in other words, not much different than most class A, B, you know, speaker power amplifiers, you know, from the last few decades. And, you know, I said, that's interesting. And it got a lot less interesting when people said, well, clearly people at shit are incompetent designers, you know. Yeah, they can't they can't actually design anything you know that measures well. I said, huh, that's it's interesting because it's dead easy. You put a bunch of op amps in a box, uh, you have a clean power supply, and you're done. Yeah, that easy. So we said, okay, we're doing this Thunderdome thing where we're doing two or more products to see how they fare with each other. You know, see who, what people buy, and. So I said, hey, let's do this with Magni. Let's do a conventional Magni, which actually the Magni 3 Plus is about as far as we can take it. It measures a lot better than a Magni 3. And to me, I think it sounds a lot better too. Um, and then uh, we had Magni 3 Plus, uh, sorry, uh, Magni Heresy, which is like, let's take a bunch of some of the best measuring op amps, put them in a box and, and see how it does. And of course, the measurements of Magni you know, Heresy murder uh, Magni 3 Plus, as you'd expect. Um, and, you know, it's, they're both $99. And the way it came out is we actually have people kind of buying them about equally. About half of our customers want Heresy and half of them want 3 Plus. And I, I don't know if that's because Heresy is black and red and, you know, 3 Plus is silver and gray, or, you know, if, if there's an actual, you know, uh, sonic difference, because we actually don't. I don't know if you noticed, but on our site, we actually never talk about how things sound. Uh, we don't really have an opinion on that. Uh, so any, anything that anyone has said is their opinion and not ours. Yeah, and, and I actually, I mentioned in the review that 
the wording on the heresy page alludes to the fact that you guys probably prefer the three plus sound. Um, but I agree, you haven't clearly said, and, and I haven't yet heard the Magni 3 Plus. I've only had a chance to have the heresy here. One of the, the channel patrons actually lent it to me for the review. So um, I, I liked it. I thought it was great, but it's actually, there's probably a nice segue here in terms of one of the other questions I had on the sheet, which is that I'm currently going through the process of trying to understand why a discrete and an integrated design sounds so different because on paper measurement wise, you can have two amplifiers measure almost identically, and yet to the ear, they absolutely sound different. Um, an example recently was the, the Heresy measures beautifully and the um, SMSL SP200 using the THX technology measures really well. Mm -hmm. I didn't really like the SP200. I found the sound very flat and lifeless, whereas the Heresy's got a nice dynamic it's, it's got a little bit of that sort of digital edge to it, I'd describe it as, mm -hmm. but it's dynamic, it's engaging, it's really enjoyable, whereas the SP200 just never got me tapping my foot at all. Wow. Do you have any insights as to why two amplifiers that, so we've probably got two questions here actually. First one is how come two amplifiers that measure identically can sound so different? What are the measurements not telling us? Well, I think part of the problem is we're only really doing a very limited suite of measurements. Um, you know, typically what you're going to be looking at is distortion at, you know, one kilohertz. Um, you know, you might do a multiband uh, measurement for IMD. Uh, you might do, uh, you know, of course, you'll do noise, you know, what, what the noise floor is. Uh, those are, you know, fairly limited measurements. It's like there's going to be all sorts of argument from all sorts of people sorts of viewpoints on like, well, does it matter what the transient response is like? Does it matter what, you know, actual musical program material is like? And can you tell the difference, say, with a null tester? There's there's a lot of argument about that. Um, we're kind of old school, kind of new school in that, you know, we do kind of the standard suite of measurements and then we listen to things. And some of the stuff we listen to doesn't sound very good and measures very well. And some of the stuff that sounds very good measures extremely poorly. Um, uh, a great example is um, the Bailey Two. Uh, that that's a, a tube hybrid product. It's you know probably 0.3% uh, THD. You know at one volt. It's you know it's literally uh, 1,000 times you know higher than a Magni Heresy. Um, mm -hmm. And what's really funny is if I do if I set up a blind test. Uh, where literally everything is level, level matched and you're just switching between them, it's very, very hard to tell the difference. Um, I kind of embarrassed myself with that one because uh, we, we, we set up a blind test between uh, Magni 3 Plus and Harrison. And I said, these might be pretty hard to tell. Let's throw in a Veili 2 because you'll be able to tell that one like immediately. I mean, one, you know, one's like a hundred almost 120 dB sine ad, one's 106, 108, and one's 40, you know, I mean. Wow. <laughs> dead easy, right? And the first time I actually went through the, the selector with actual level match stuff, I'm like, oh, crap. Well, actually, at first I was like, well, it's all shorted together, you know, it's not, actually not working. And I asked the guy who set it up, I said, hey, you know, it's all shorted together. He's like, no, it isn't. And he said, it's just really hard to tell. And so I'd had, you know, a beer or two. And so that made it even harder to tell. Uh, and he's like, go to the, go to the, uh, actually, uh, I won't name the name of the company, but go to a, another higher end set of headphones and try those. It's easier to tell. Um, and so I tried those and I, I got all three right. And I'm like, okay, good. That's great. But I mean, it's insanely hard to tell the difference between mm. stuff. It'd be grossly different. Uh, part of it is a lot of the listening you're going to do is at very low levels. You know, you might be at, you know, 100 millivolts, you know, or 50 millivolts rather than one volt or four volts, or, you know, you might even be lower, you know, on, on the scale. So uh, we don't typically measure how things behave there because you can't really see the distortion. You just kind of see the noise floor. Um, so that's my kind of long-winded way of saying we don't have all the answers. Uh, however, uh, so if you look at the characteristics of, say, an integrated amp uh, or integrated circuit-based amp, uh, you'll have very, very high gain uh, with 
very, very high feedback to bring gain down. So that linearizes the output stage, leads to great measurements. Um, in a discrete amp, you have lots of choices. You can do a very simple discrete amp uh, that actually has very low, what they call loop gain, open loop gain, and so it'll have low feedback. And that's typically kind of where we go. Our, our uh, loop gains are, are fairly low. We're not trying to push them into the stratosphere and get you know, super, you know, super high res you know, results. But Magni 3 Plus is, is getting is getting there. If we did a couple other tricks, if we cast coded some things, and if we we actually went with more of an instrumentation amp type front end, you know, we could we could get numbers that are at or better than than op amps. The problem is then price goes up. So mm. what do you want to do? You know, should we should we make a Asgard three plus, you know, that does that? I I don't know. Asgard three is actually even lower loop gain than Magni 3 Plus, and a lot of people like it. A lot of people actually like that sound better. And personally to me, you know, the Asgard 3 is, it's a warmer, fun, happier sounding amp, you know, and that's, that's subjective. It will never appear on our website, but in my opinion, it's a kind of a warm, you know, fun amp, whether it's, you know, Magni 3 Plus is, is more neutral. And as you go to higher loop gain, as you go to more, you know, more linear amp, it seems like a lot of things kind of trend that way. I want to jump in here and talk really briefly about loop gain that Jason's referring to. So the idea being that every circuit has a maximum gain it can produce, and that's the open loop gain. The problem is that often with that full gain, there's also quite a bit of noise. And so that's where feedback is applied, and I'll let Jason explain exactly what feedback is in a moment, but that's where feedback is applied to both reduce the noise, but in doing so, reduce the gain of the amplifier. So what we need to know for this part is that open loop gain or loop gain, as Jason sometimes calling it, is essentially the maximum output that a circuit can produce, whether it's a chip circuit or a discrete circuit, and that it then has feedback applied to pull that gain and the noise down. Alternatively, some amplifiers use a lower open loop gain design, which then means they don't need to use the feedback to pull down the noise floor. And yet, like you said, you have two amps that both measure great, and you know, one sounds pretty good and one sounds not so good, or one sounds pretty good and one sounds great, you know, what whatever the you know the metric is. And I don't have an explanation for that. I've noticed that myself um, in, in our in our approaches, that a hell sounds different than uh, a Magni Heresy, which both use the same basic idea, and that also sounds very different from a Magnus. So, mm. yeah, it, it's... <laughs> I can enjoy all of them, you know, all of these products I've at least spent, you know, several weekends with, and, you know, I would be happy to have on my desk, but, um, you know, my preference, I usually do come back to, you know, the discrete stuff, but, you know, who knows, maybe I'm, maybe I'm fooling myself. I mean, I've, I've seen that, that before and, and in other interviews, it's like, look, the, the way you interact with an amp, you know, the, the ramp of the volume on the volume pot, the quality of the volume pot, the quality of the controls, how it looks, you know, your mood that day, you know, are you excited you got something new or, you know, did you get something that has a scratch on it? You know, the, all of that factors in mm -hmm. uh, a lot of that, uh, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta look at the, the longer term aspects of that. How do you feel about it after you listen to it for a month? Uh, my business partner will, say hey you know you can only really tell after you've gotten you know a lot of a lot of experience and you're you've integrated that experience and i'm like well i don't know you know i i can i can kind of plug things in and decide if i like them or not but again i can be fooling myself yeah and i definitely i think that's a really interesting point there are i find with reviews that i'll often have an immediate impression of a product mm -hmm. and i find that like what you've said there that that impression tends to stick around occasionally it just gets totally changed when i i put on a different piece of music or something I go, oh hang on no i've, I've misinterpreted this but most yep. of the time it stays but it gets adjusted over time and i suddenly go okay yes it's this but it's also a little bit of that 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 tends to be my evolution over the course of a review um so yeah i can definitely relate to kind of both sides of that when we're doing our internal uh stuff our you know really early internal evaluations new products uh, we don't talk to each other about them. You know, we take them home, um, 
and then we see what we think and and then you know in a in a closed forum you know we each kind of say you know what what we think without you know without actually going and saying hey this is the greatest thing ever mike you got to try it you know it, it's more like okay let's all take them home and see what we think and and it, it works a lot better that way because if everyone kind of has the same impression, that's kind of a strong indication that it really is that way. And it's not just, I'm not really just fooling myself. Yeah, that's a good point. And obviously auditory bias is something that's been pretty well proved that if you're told something sounds great, it's gonna be harder for you not to hear it sound great. Um, so that that's a really interesting insight as to how you guys work to keep that stuff at bay. That's really good. Yeah, and if we're if we're in doubt, um, like we were in doubt uh, when we were going to release Bifrost 2, uh, there was kind of a doubt. One of our guys said, hey, I don't think this sounds better than Bifrost. Um, yeah, I've been spending a lot of time with it. I'm not that thrilled with it. And I said, that's cool. Let's set up a blind test. And so a lot of times we will do a blind test and we'll do a blind level matched. And, you know, people will go and listen and then we'll vote. And it was really funny because everyone voted for Bifrost 2 in that case. So... Well, you know, who knows? Maybe he had the wrong one connected. Maybe he just decided he didn't like it. Or maybe, you know, to his ears and to his perception, it's not as good. Uh, that's a lot of things, you know, we don't talk about is individuals do have preferences. And I will, I'll, you know, freely admit I kind of skew towards the warmer, happier sound, which is really ironic considering most of the stuff we do is fairly neutral. Um, I get pushed out of, warm and happy place because you know a lot of people are like oh, it's, it's too warm it's too fuzzy don't like it it's like okay fair enough you know I, that's your opinion yeah no and i can relate to that because i'm all of my equipment tends to skew towards with a couple of exceptions tends to skew towards that slightly warmer like i like mm -hmm. engaging in the music not just hearing the music um yeah. and so I'm, I'm really similar where i've got you know most of my headphones are leaning towards the warmer sound i've got a little bit of a, a bass increase compared to a flat response because i like that engaging experience so i definitely relate there while we're on the topic of the the integrated and, and um, discrete sound we've talked about two amps that measure the same sounding different is there anything further to that that you can share in terms of why integrated and discrete tend to sound different i'm, I'm yet to hear an integrated amp that actually sounds as I don't know if smooth is the right word because it, it makes it sound rolled off, which is not where I'm coming from. But the um, if I jump over into the, the DAC world for a moment, I've been playing around. I've done a, a whole series of chord DAC reviews recently. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I've found with them and, and Rob Watt's focus on the transient timing is they produce a sound that has a fullness and a, a three-dimensionality to all of the notes. It's not just this 2D plane. What I've found with the discrete amps versus the integrated amps is the discrete amps tend to do something similar where they give a better sense of that three-dimensional depth, both in the overall sound stage, but also individual instruments. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, is there anything that you're aware of in there that would explain that, or is that just one of those mysteries of sound that we don't yet fully understand? There's, there's a lot of speculation. It's, it's funny. I'd, I'd love to know absolutely why. Um, to me, it seems like... It comes down to uh, essentially if you have a very linear amplifier with, with low with low gain and low feedback, basically what you're doing is you're applying light correction to a very linear system. Um, whereas an op amp, let's face it, it can be horrible open loop, and most of them are like shockingly bad open loop. Uh, a Magni three plus can get within, you know, say 10 dB sign out of, you know, some of the, some of the best stuff out there. This is a $99 amp with like 30 dB of feedback, not 120. So mm. it's like, you know, there's, they can be shockingly bad open loop, you know, very, very, you know, low bandwidth, you know, nonlinear, et cetera. That's not actually, let me be clear. That's not to crap all over what, say, the guys at TI are doing or the guys at analog devices are doing. It, they have some fantastic parts that, when used correctly, they're wonderful. You know, don't have a problem with that. I mean, the um, one of their differential amps, the LME49724, which is a, a, a supersymmetry, I think, type design, 
uh, is very, very good. I mean, so good that, you know, we've, we've put it up against, um, you know, uh, discreets and went, yeah, you know, um, this is either a very hard decision or it's going to go on the, the integrated side. Mm, uh, wow. Yeah. So it's not universal, but if I had my druthers, yeah, I would do fairly low loop gain, very high inherent linearity. And I'd probably isolate the output stage as much as possible from the rest with a, a local loop. If you're going to use feedback, just because the output stage, you know, bears, you know, it, it takes all the hard hits. It, you know, if it's a speaker, especially it's, it's, you know, hit, hooked up to a very reactive load. And essentially if you can isolate that, um, it seems to give you an overall better result. And then, you know, tomorrow I'll design something like that and it'll sound like crap and I'll go, oh, well. <laughs> yeah. And then I'll find actually I did something very wrong internally because the other great and horrible thing about analog discrete design is you have control of everything. You know, uh, what, you know, what is the current flowing through the voltage gain stage? What's the compensation like? What's, what's the compensation schema? You know, how you know how much current do you have to run through those intermediate stages to make sure everything stays in class a except the output stage or when class a output class a output and so you know i can see why analog designers are kind of few and far between analog discrete design it's a it's a pain um mm. and, and there are many many failure modes um you know i've been doing this since the sumo days and you know uh, early 90s so it's like eh you know, it's kind of second nature, but even I get surprised by like, I never saw it fail like that before. You, know? <laughs> you mentioned something there that's probably worth clarifying because I, I've got a vague understanding, but not a deep understanding. So I'm guessing there'll be a lot of viewers in the same boat. When we're talking about feedback, my understanding is it's a, a process where the signal is fed back to itself to cancel out noise mm -hmm. and distortion. Yes. Is, is it as simple as that or, or can you provide a slightly more detailed but still simplified explanation for us lay people it, it's literally as simple as that Let, let's say um you have an op amp um that has a gain of you know let's say one literally and this is this is not being hyperbolic to say has a gain of one hundred thousand times you know obviously you can't use that in a headphone amp where you want a gain of you know sometimes you want negative gain but sometimes you know you, the most you're going to want is 10 or 20 db of gain <laughs> so of that say 120 db of open loop gain it has you're going to feed back the vast majority of signal 100 db to get the 20 db out or 100 all 120 to get the you know zero db gain out um so the more gain you have the more you know the more tools you have to play with feedback um and the lower loop gain the, sim the simpler the circuit the lower the loop gain the, the less feedback you have to to play with and then the linearity of the of the devices and the circuit itself uh, come into play there's also error correction or some people love to call it feed forward which is it's it's error correction basically instead of feeding back the entire signal you're only feeding back the error signal so you're taking the difference between the idealized signal and the output the actual output you're subtracting that and then feeding that back uh, we did that at sumo in the 90s, you know, Bob Cordell and Malcolm Hoxford have both written, you know, huge papers on feed forward error correction. And it's a really neat technique. It can be very, very powerful. Um, it's, in fact, I know it's internal on in some of the op amps we use. They actually use feed forward in the OPA 1688 and 1656. Um, so we get that kind of for free in the op amp, or we can design it in at, at great pain, like the sumo amps did we actually had our own feed forward error correction um, system which worked very well uh, but it had to be trimmed for each amp so literally you're in there with a screwdriver and you're trimming it for minimum distortion uh, you can understand why you don't want to do that on say a 99 dollar product but maybe 9.99 that'd be fine yeah and i guess that that's one of the big things i guess when we have these conversations around integrated and discrete and different circuit designs. It's all about maximizing the performance at the price ultimately, isn't it? Yeah, it's, uh, and that it will, really will come down to that. The op amps give you a lot of tools, you know, in, a, in, a, in one box that help you keep price down. If you're good, if you're, you know, 
clever at discrete, you can usually keep the price down as well. But discrete is always going to be a little bit more, a little bit more pain. Maybe, you know, I'm sure some people that shit would say it's a lot more pain. <laughs> <laughs> But it's always going to be more interesting. There'll be more variation. There will be, you know, more interesting failure modes. Um, Magni 3 Plus has a lot more protection inherently wrapped around it than Magni Heresy because Heresy has all the protection in the op -ins.